Most people consider life a battle, but it is not a battle. It is a game. The law of assumption is a new thought concept made most popular by Neville Goddard. The idea being that if you assume you already are that which you want to be, all of the forces of the universe will conspire in your favor. Of course, the opposite applies. But in 1925, a then 20-year-old Neville Goddard was just beginning his New York theater career. Meanwhile, a 54-year-old female illustrator had just finished writing her very first book. The book was not presumably received well by most publishers within the region as she could not find anyone willing to publish it. But this was a very powerful book that needed to be available to the broader public. This was only a few years after World War I and the world was still in a state of despair and repair. Within the chapters of this book, she wrote about divine design, forgiveness, love, non-resistance. Similar to Neville Goddard and Reverend Ike, it was a near blasphemous interpretation of Christianity, the acceptable doctrine, and the words of Jesus Christ himself. But unlike these two, who could rely on their successful Western predecessors to supply credibility to their wild spiritual claims, unlike me and content creators like me, she had near no one save for the accounts of her students, which wouldn't have carried much weight, and William Walker Atkinson. But he was a man, an attorney, and a merchant. She was just a woman, a mother, and an illustrator. Even this was a stroke of good luck, as the Society of Illustrators refused to elect women into their organization until 1922, but she was somehow elected in 1903. Even today, the path of self-publishing is risky. Your book doesn't have to go anywhere without a team of marketers and experts pushing it. Perhaps other respected authors in the field and sometimes just famous people endorsing it. But as this became the only path allotted to her, she herself published The Game of Life and How to Play It. Her name was Florence Scovo Shin. Most people consider life a battle. But it is not a battle. It is a game. It is a game, however, which cannot be played successfully without the knowledge of spiritual law and the Old and the New Testaments give the rules of the game with wonderful clearness. Jesus Christ taught that it was a great game of giving and receiving. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This means that whatever man sends out in word or deed will return to him. What he gives, he will receive. If he gives hate, he will receive hate. If he gives love, he will receive love. If he gives criticism, he will receive criticism. If he lies, he will be lied to. If he cheats, he will be cheated. We are taught also that the imaging faculty plays a leading part in the game of life. Keep thy heart or imagination with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. This means that what man images sooner or later externalizes in his affairs. This is the very first paragraph of the game of life and how to play it. Technically the very first documented paragraph of Florence's professional writing career. Call me a geek, but I think that is a very important piece of new thought history. From here, she would go on to publish Your Word is Your Wand in 1928, The Secret Door to Success in 1940, and a few more books posthumously, thanks in part to Louise Hay. The funny thing about Florence's books is that when they are collected into a compilation, they kind of read like a devotional. There are thoughts, success stories, and affirmations for all parts of life, including challenges many of us may face, debt, death, marriage, skin conditions, heart conditions, poverty, self-termination, loss of all kind. She addresses each area and offers advice and healing words. So for the remainder of this video, feel free to treat it sort of like a devotional and sort of like a collection of stories where you can jump around throughout the chapters and click the stories that appeal to you in that particular moment. I do feel this would be a very interactive way to get to know Florence Scovel Shin and her ideology that seemed to have helped an innumerable amount of people. Real love is selfless and free from fear. 
It pours itself out upon the object of its affection without demanding any return. Its joy is in the joy of giving. Love is God in manifestation and the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Pure, unselfish love draws to itself its own. It does not need to seek or demand. A woman came to me in deep distress. The man she loved had left her for other women and said he never intended to marry her. She was torn with jealousy and resentment and said she hoped he would suffer as he had made her suffer and added, how could he leave me when I loved him so much? I replied, you are not loving that man. You are hating him and added, you can never receive what you have never given. Give a perfect love and you will receive a perfect love. Perfect yourself on this man. Give him a perfect, unselfish love, demanding nothing in return. Do not criticize or condemn, and bless him wherever he is, she replied. No, I won't bless him unless I know where he is. Well, I said, that is not real love. When you send out real love, real love will return to you, either from this man or his equivalent. For if this man is not the divine selection, you will not want him. As you are one with God, you are one with the love which belongs to you by divine right. Several months passed, and matters remained about the same, but she was working conscientiously with herself. I said, when you are no longer disturbed by his cruelty, he will cease to be cruel as you are attracting it through your own emotions. Then I told her of a brotherhood in India who never said good morning to each other. They used these words, I salute the divinity in you. They saluted the divinity in every man and in the wild animals in the jungle, and they were never harmed, for they saw only God in every living thing. I said, salute the divinity in this man and say, I see your divine self only. I see you as God sees you, perfect, made in his image and likeness. She found she was becoming more poised and gradually losing her resentment. He was a captain and she always called him the cap. One day she said suddenly, God bless the cap, wherever he is. I replied, now that is real love. And when you have become a complete circle, and are no longer disturbed by the situation, you will have his love or attract its equivalent. I was moving at this time and did not have a telephone, so was out of touch with her for a few weeks, when one morning I received a letter saying, we are married. At the earliest opportunity, I paid her a call. My first words were, what happened? Oh, she exclaimed, a miracle. One day I woke up and all suffering had ceased, I saw him that evening and he asked me to marry him. We were married in about a week and I have never seen a more devoted man. There is an old saying, no man is your enemy, no man is your friend, every man is your teacher. So one should become impersonal and learn what each man has to teach him and soon he would learn his lessons and be free. The woman's lover was teaching her selfless love which every man sooner or later must learn. Suffering is not necessary for man's development. It is the result of violation of spiritual law. But few people seem to be able to rouse themselves from their soul sleep without it. The body may be renewed and transformed through the spoken word and clear vision, and disease be completely wiped out of the consciousness. The metaphysician knows that all disease has a mental correspondence and in order to heal the body, one must first heal the soul. In the 23rd Psalm we read, He restoreth my soul. This means that the subconscious mind or soul must be restored with the right ideas and the mystical marriage is the marriage of the soul and the spirit or the subconscious and superconscious mind. They must be one. When the subconscious is flooded with the perfect ideas of the superconscious, God and man are one. I and the Father are one. It is safe to say that all sickness and unhappiness 
come from the violation of the law of love. A new commandment I give unto you, love one another. A woman I know had for years an appearance of terrible skin disease. The doctors told her it was incurable and she was in despair. She was on the stage and she feared she would soon have to give up her profession and she had no other means of support. She, however, procured a good engagement and on the opening night made a great hit. She received flattering notices from the critics and was joyful and elated. The next day she received a notice of dismissal. A man in the cast had been jealous of her success and had caused her to be sent away. She felt hatred and resentment taking complete possession of her and she cried out, Oh God, don't let me hate that man. That night she worked for hours in the silence. She said, I soon came into a very deep silence. I seemed to be at peace with myself, with the man, and with the whole world. I continued this for two following nights, and on the third day I found I was healed completely of the skin disease. In asking for love or good will, she had fulfilled the law, for love is the fulfilling of the law, and the disease, which came from subconscious resentment, was wiped out. Nothing on earth can resist an absolutely non-resistant person. The Chinese say that water is the most powerful element because it is perfectly non-resistant. It can wear away a rock and sweep all before it. Jesus Christ said, resist not evil, for he knew in reality there is no evil, therefore nothing to resist. Evil has come of man's vain imagination or a belief in two powers, good and evil. There is no legend that Adam and Eve ate of Maya, the tree of illusion, and saw two powers instead of one power, God. Therefore, evil is a false law man has made for himself through psychoma or soul sleep. Soul sleep means that man's soul has been hypnotized by the race belief of sin, sickness, and death, etc., which is carnal or mortal thought, and his affairs have outpictured his illusions. We have read in a preceding chapter that man's soul is his subconscious mind, and whatever he feels deeply, good or bad, is outpictured by that faithful servant. His body and affairs show forth what he has been picturing. The sick man has pictured sickness, the poor man, poverty, the rich man, wealth. People often say, why does a little child attract illness when it is too young even to know what it means? I answer that children are sensitive and receptive to the thoughts of others about them and often outpicture the fears of their parents. I heard a metaphysician once say, if you do not run your subconscious mind yourself, someone else will run it for you. Mothers often, unconsciously, attract illness and disaster to their children by continually holding them in thoughts of fear and watching for symptoms. For example, a friend asked a woman if her little girl had had the measles. She replied promptly, not yet. This implied that she was expecting the illness and therefore preparing the way for what she did not want for herself and child. However, the man who is centered and established in right thinking, the man who sends out only goodwill to his fellow man, and who is without fear, cannot be touched or influenced by the negative thoughts of others. In fact, he could then receive only good thoughts, as he himself sends forth only good thoughts. Resistance is hell, for it places man in a state of torment. A metaphysician once gave me a wonderful recipe for taking every trick in the game of life. It is the acme of non-resistance. He gave it in this way. At one time in my life, I baptized children. And of course, they had many names. Now I no longer baptize children, but I baptize events. But I give every event the same name. 
If I have a failure, I baptize it success in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In this we see the great law of transmutation founded on non-resistance. Through his spoken word, every failure was transmuted into success. For example, a woman who required money and who knew the spiritual law of opulence was thrown continually in a business way with a man who made her feel very poor. He talked lack and limitation and she commenced to catch his poverty thoughts so she disliked him and blamed him for her failure. She knew in order to demonstrate her supply, she must first feel that she had received a feeling of opulence, must precede its manifestation. It dawned upon her one day that she was resisting the situation and seeing two powers instead of one. So she blessed the man and baptized the situation success, she affirmed, as there is only one power, God, this man is here for my good and my prosperity, just what he did not seem to be there for. Soon after that, she met, through this man, a woman who gave her for a service rendered several thousand dollars, and the man moved to a distant city and faded harmoniously from her life. Make the statement, every man is a golden link in the chain of my good. For all men are God in manifestation, awaiting the opportunity given by man himself to serve the divine plan of his life. Bless your enemy, and you rob him of his ammunition. His arrows will be transmuted into blessings. Isaiah said, My word shall not return unto me void but shall accomplish that whereunto it is sent. We know now that the word and thoughts are a tremendous vibratory force, ever molding a man's body and affairs. A woman came to me in great distress and said she was to be sued on the 15th of the month for $3,000. She knew no way of getting the money and was in despair. I told her God was her supply and that there is a supply for every demand. So I spoke the word. I gave thanks that the woman would receive $3,000 at the right time in the right way. I told her she must have perfect faith and act her perfect faith. The 15th came, but no money had materialized. She called me on the phone and asked what she was to do. I replied, it is Saturday, so they won't sue you today. Your part is to act rich thereby showing perfect faith that you will receive it by Monday. She asked me to lunch with her to keep up her courage. When I joined her at the restaurant, I said, this is no time to economize. Order an expensive luncheon. Act as if you have already received the $3,000. All things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. You must act as if you had already received. The next morning, she called me on the phone and asked me to stay with her during the day. I said, no, you are divinely protected and God is never too late. In the evening, she phoned again, greatly excited and said, my dear, a miracle has happened. I was sitting in my room this morning when the doorbell rang. I said to the maid, don't let anyone in. The maid, however, looked out the window and said, it's your cousin with the long white beard. So I said, call him back. I would like to see him. He was just turning the corner when he heard the maid's voice and he came back. He talked for about an hour and just as he was leaving, he said, oh, by the way, how are finances? I told him I needed the money and he said, why, my dear, I will give you $3,000 the first of the month. I didn't like to tell him I was going to be sued. What shall I do? I won't receive it till the first of the month and I must have it tomorrow, I said. I'll keep on treating. I said, spirit is never too late. I give thanks she has received the money on the invisible plane and that it manifests on time. The next morning, her cousin called her up and said, come to my office this morning and I will give you the money. That afternoon, she had $3,000 to her credit in the bank and wrote checks as rapidly as her excitement would permit. If one asks for success, and prepares for failure, 
he will get the situation he has prepared for. For example, a man came to me asking me to speak the word that a certain debt would be wiped out. I found he spent his time planning what he would say to the man when he did not pay his bill, thereby neutralizing my words. He should have seen himself paying the debt. We have a wonderful illustration of this in the Bible, relating to the three kings who were in the desert without water for their men and horses. They consulted the prophet Elisha, who gave them this astonishing message. Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet make this valley full of ditches. Man must prepare for the thing he has asked for when there isn't the slightest sign of it in sight. For example, a woman found it necessary to look for an apartment during the year when there was a great shortage of apartments in New York. It was considered almost an impossibility, and her friends were sorry for her and said, Isn't it too bad? You'll have to store your furniture and live in a hotel. She replied, You needn't feel sorry for me. I'm a superman, and I'll get an apartment. She spoke the words, Infinite spirit, open the way for the right apartment. She knew there was a supply for her every demand, and that she was unconditioned working on the spiritual plane and that one with God is a majority. She had contemplated buying new blankets when the tempter, the adverse thought or reasoning mind suggested, don't buy the blankets. Perhaps after all, you won't get an apartment and you will have no use for them. She promptly replied to herself, I'll dig my ditches by buying the blankets. So she prepared for the apartment acted as though she already had it. She found one in a miraculous way, and it was given to her, although there were over 200 other applicants. Man can only receive what he sees himself receiving. The enlightened man endeavors to perfect himself upon his neighbor. His work is with himself, to send out goodwill and blessings to every man. And the marvelous thing is, that if one blesses a man, he has no power to harm him. For example, a man came to me asking to treat for success in business. He was selling machinery and a rival appeared on the scene with what he proclaimed was a better machine. And my friend feared defeat. I said, first of all, we must wipe out all fear and know that God protects your interests and that the divine idea must come out of the situation. That is, the right machine will be sold by the right man to the right man. And I added, don't hold one critical thought towards that man. Bless him all day and be willing not to sell your machine if it isn't the divine idea. So he went to the meeting, fearless and non-resistant, and blessing the other man. He said the outcome was very remarkable. The other man's machine refused to work, and he sold his without the slightest difficulty. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which spitefully use you and persecute you. Goodwill produces a great aura of protection about the one who sends it, and no weapon that is formed against him shall prosper. A woman came to me complaining that she had no money with which to buy Christmas gifts. She said, Last year was so different. I had plenty of money and gave lovely presents, and this year I have scarcely a cent. I replied, You will never demonstrate money while you are pathetic and live in the past. Live fully in the now and get ready to give Christmas presents. Dig your ditches and the money will come. She exclaimed, I know what to do. I will buy some tinsel twine, Christmas seals, and wrapping paper. I replied, do that, and the presents will come and stick themselves to the Christmas seals. This, too, was showing financial fearlessness and faith in God. As the reasoning mind said, keep every cent you have as you are not sure you will get any more. She bought the seals, paper, and twine, and a few days before Christmas received a gift of several hundred dollars. 
Buying the seals and twine had impressed the subconscious with expectancy and opened the way for the manifestation of the money. She purchased all the presents in plenty of time. Man must live suspended in the moment. Look well, therefore, to this day, such is the salutation of the dawn. He must be spiritually alert, ever awaiting his leads, taking advantage of every opportunity. One day I said continually, silently, Infinite Spirit, don't let me miss a trick. And something very important was told to me that evening. It is most necessary to begin the day with right words. Make an affirmation immediately upon waking. For example, Thy will be done this day. Today is a day of completion. I give thanks for this perfect day. Miracle shall follow miracle, and wonders shall never cease. Make this a habit, and one will see wonders and miracles come into his life. Knowledge of the law gives man power to rub out his mistakes. Man cannot force the external to be what he is not. If he desires riches, he must be rich first in consciousness. For example, a woman came to me asking treatment for prosperity. She did not take much interest in her household affairs and her home was in great disorder. I said to her, if you wish to be rich, you must be orderly. All men with great wealth are orderly and order is heaven's first law. I added, you will never become rich with a burnt match in the pincushion. She had a good sense of humor and commenced immediately putting her house in order. She rearranged furniture, straightened out bureau drawers, cleaned rugs, and soon made a big financial demonstration, a gift from a relative. The woman herself became made over and keeps herself keyed up financially by being ever watchful of the external and expecting prosperity, knowing God is her supply. Many people are in ignorance of the fact that gifts and things are investments and that hoarding and saving invariably lead to loss. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat but it tendeth to poverty. For example, I knew a man who wanted to buy a fur-lined coat. He and his wife went to various shops, but there was none he wanted. He said they were all too cheap looking. At last, he was shown one. The salesman said was valued at a thousand dollars, but which the manager would sell him for five hundred dollars, as it was late in the season. His financial possessions amounted to about seven hundred dollars. The reasoning mind would have said, you can't afford to spend nearly all you have on a coat, but he was very intuitive and never reasoned. He turned to his wife and said, if I get this coat, I'll make a ton of money. So his wife consented weakly. About a month later, he received a $10,000 commission. The coat made him feel so rich, it linked him with success and prosperity. Without the coat, he would not have received the commission. It was an investment paying large dividends. If a man ignores these leadings to spend or to give, the same amount of money will go in an uninteresting or unhappy way. For example, a woman told me on Thanksgiving Day, she informed her family that they could not afford a Thanksgiving dinner. She had the money, but decided to save it. A few days later, Someone entered her room and took from the bureau drawer the exact amount of money dinner would have cost. A woman came to me asking me to speak the word for a position. So I demanded, infinite spirit, open the way for this woman's right position. Never ask for just a position, ask for the right position position, the place already planned in divine mind as it is the only one that will give satisfaction. I then gave thanks that she had already received and that it would manifest quickly. Very soon, she had three positions offered to her, two in New York and one in Palm Beach, and she did not know which to choose. I said, ask for a definite lead. The time was almost up. 
and was still undecided when one day she telephoned. When I woke up this morning, I could smell Palm Beach. She had been there before and knew its balmy fragrance. I replied, well, if you can smell Palm Beach from here, it is certainly your lead. She accepted the position and it proved a great success. Often, one's lead comes at an unexpected time. If a man is in debt or people owe him money, it shows that a belief of debt is in the subconscious mind. This belief must be neutralized in order to change conditions. For example, a woman came to me saying a man had owed her $1,000 for years, which she could not compel him to pay. I said, you must work on yourself, not the man, and gave her this statement. I deny debt. There is no debt in divine mind. No man owes me anything. All is squared. I send that man love and forgiveness. In a few weeks, she received a letter from him saying he intended sending the money and in about a month, came the thousand dollars if the student owes money change the statement there is no debt in divine mind therefore i owe no man anything all is squared all my obligations are now wiped out under grace in a perfect way i deny debt there is no debt in divine mind no man owes me anything all is squared i send forth love and forgiveness Faith without works or action is dead. The student, in order to bring into manifestation the answer to his prayer, must show active faith. For example, a woman came to me asking me to speak the word for the renting of a room. I gave her the statement. I give thanks that the room is now rented to the right and perfect man for the right price, giving perfect satisfaction. Several weeks elapsed, but the room had not been rented. I asked, have you shown active faith? Have you followed every hunch in regard to the room? She replied, I had a hunch to get a lamp for the room, but I decided I couldn't afford it. I said, you'll never rent the room until you get the lamp, for in buying the lamp, you are acting your faith, impressing the subconscious mind with certainty. I asked, what is the price of the lamp? She answered, four dollars. I exclaimed, four dollars standing between you and the perfect man? She became so enthusiastic, she bought two lamps. About a week elapsed and in walked the perfect man. He did not smoke and paid the rent in advance and fulfilled her ideal in every way. Unless you become as a little child and dig your ditches, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of manifestation. Talking too much about your affairs, scattering your forces, brings you up against a high wall. I knew a man of brains and ability who was a complete failure. He lived with his mother and aunt, and I found that every night when he went home to dinner, he told them, all that had taken place during the day at the office. He discussed his hopes, his fears, and his failures. I said to him, you scatter your forces by talking about your affairs. Don't discuss your business with your family. Silence is golden. He took my lead. During dinner, he refused to talk about business. His mother and aunt were in despair. They loved to hear all about everything, but his silence proved golden. Not long after, he was given a position at $100 a week, and in a few years, he had a salary of $300 a week. Success is not a secret, it is a system. Hope looks forward. Faith knows it has already received and acts accordingly. In my classes, I often emphasize the importance of digging ditches or preparing for the thing asked for, which shows active faith and brings the demonstration to pass. A man in my class whom I called the life of the party because he always tried to find a question I couldn't answer, asked, why is it then a lot of women who prepare hope chests never get married? I replied, because it is a hope chest and not a faith chest. 
The prospective bride also violates law in telling others about it. Her friends come in and sit on the hope chest, and either doubt or hope shall never succeed. Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The student should never talk of a demonstration until it has jowled or comes to pass on the external. So a hope chest should become a faith chest and be kept from the public eye and the words spoken for the divine selection of a husband under grace in a perfect way. The science of numbers and the reading of horoscopes keep man down on the mental or mortal plane for they deal only with the karmic path. I know of a man who should have been dead years ago, according to his horoscope, but he is alive and a leader of one of the biggest movements in this country for the uplift of humanity. It takes a very strong mind to neutralize a prophecy of evil. The student should declare, every false prophecy shall come to naught. Every plan my father in heaven has not planned shall be dissolved and dissipated. The divine idea now comes to pass. However, if any good message has ever been given one of coming happiness or wealth, harbor and expect it, and it will manifest sooner or later through the law of expectancy. A man came to me dejected, miserable, and poor. His wife was interested in the science of numbers and had had him read. It seems the report was not very favorable, for he said, My wife says I'll never amount to anything because I am a two. I replied, I don't care what your number is. You are a perfect idea in divine mind, and we will demand the success and prosperity which are already planned for you by that infinite intelligence. Within a few weeks, he had a very fine position, and a year or two later, he achieved a brilliant success as a writer. This video would not be complete without including affirmations and lots of them because Florence Scovel Shin was huge on affirmations. Her second book, Your Word is Your Wand, is mostly affirmations. I've compiled what I consider to be her best affirmations and by best, I just mean that they translate better to modern language. Regarding the subject of affirmations, Florence has this to say. One should never use an affirmation unless it is absolutely satisfying and convincing to his own consciousness. And often an affirmative is changed to suit different people. And with that in mind, let's hear some of them. Endless good now comes to me in endless ways. The Christ in me is risen. I now fulfill my destiny. The tide of destiny has turned and everything comes my way. As one door shuts, another door opens. God's plan for me is permanent and cannot be budged. I am true to my heavenly vision. What God has done for others, he can do for me and more. Every man is a golden link in the chain of my good. God cannot fail, so I cannot fail. The warrior within me has already won. The ground I am on is holy ground. The ground I am on is successful ground. I am in perfect harmony with the working of the law. My God is a God of plenty, and I now receive all that I desire or require and more. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of abundance forever. I am fearless in letting money go out, knowing God is my immediate and endless supply. My endless good now comes to me in endless ways. My happiness has been built upon a rock. It is mine now and for all eternity. Happy surprises come to me each day. I look with wonder at that which is before me. As I am one with God, I am now one with my heart's desire. I give thanks for my permanent happiness, my permanent health, my permanent wealth, my permanent love. I love everyone and everyone loves me. I am at peace with myself and with the whole world. I forgive everyone and everyone forgives me. Faith without nerve is dead. Power moves but is never moved. I am poised 
and powerful, my greatest expectations are realized in miraculous ways. I am unmoved by appearances, therefore, appearances move. I now stand aside and watch God work. It interests me to see how quickly and easily he brings the desires of my heart to pass. There is no loss in divine mind, therefore, I cannot lose anything which belongs to me. It will be restored, or I receive its equivalent. There is no competition on the spiritual plane. What is mine is given me under grace. I am willing to come last, therefore I come first. All things I seek are now seeking me. God's work is finished now and must manifest. I am undisturbed by appearances. I now have the single eye of the spirit and see only completion. Florence Govelshin was born on the 24th of September, 1871, and passed away in October of 1940. She touched many lives during the course of her own, though she continued to influence the world long after her passing. It is said that she is one of the inspirations of Louise Hay, author of the 1984 bestseller, You Can Heal Your Life, and founder of Hay House Publishing. Hay House has been responsible in part for giving the stage to many new thought authors you may already know. Authors like Deepak Chopra, Colette Baron reed Esther Hicks, Wayne Dyer, Ayan Lavanzent, and Brendan Burchard, just to name a few. It goes without saying, but these renowned authors have contributed so much to the world by helping individuals in the moments when they really needed help and guidance and hope the most. Hay House, of course, being founded by Louise Hay. Louise Hay, whose earlier influences was Florence Scovel Shen. And with that being said, thank you for watching this video. I truly do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I trust you'll give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for more content just like this one. So how did you like today's video and what video would you like to see next? You let me know in the comment section down below. I cannot wait to see you in the next video. Toodles.